All right, welcome everyone. Uh, the Urban Forestry Commission meeting, Northampton Urban Forestry Commission, September 21st, 2022. This meeting is being recorded. I'm going to set up the captions. Um, one second. Interesting. For some reason, I cannot set up the captions. All right. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we have uh, some members of the public that I'd like to recognize if they're interested in speaking. So we have Jackie Balance who has her hand up. Hello, Jackie. Hi, everybody. It's me again. I can't stay too long because I want to get to the uh, finance committee hearing to discuss uh, the half a million dollars for St. John Cantius Church, yay or nay. But I have two things to say to my friends at Urban Forestry. Um, one is I heard through the grapevine that the people on Moorfield Place decided to boycott the meeting with urban forestry yesterday. And after what they went through with Mayor Narkowitz and the DPW, if I were in their shoes, I can say I can't blame them. Although they do not appreciate how wonderful the urban forestry committee is. Y'all are not the enemy, but there are some people in other parts of municipal government that do not listen to the voices of the citizens and what happened on Warfield Place, they could have a chance to go through their grieving process and enjoy a few more beautiful springs. I can't blame them, but I don't want y'all to take it personally. Um, and I want to report that uh, one of the, you know, you're probably familiar with the infill brouhaha we've had in Bay State Village the last couple of years. Um, I just walked past one of the first two houses that John Hansel built on my block and he put two maple trees in the front yard of each house but one of them one of those maple trees is definitely dead because the person who bought the house rented it out for a year and she didn't take care of any part of the plantings and didn't water and she didn't even mow until this August two summers without mowing it was pretty it was pretty wild there, um, but that's what happens to those trees when they're not taken care of. It was a, you know, it had a trunk about this big and it didn't get any water. And now it's got all these dried up leaves. To... Arrest her. Ah, that's it. I've said my piece. I love you guys. You're great. You're the best uh, committee in the whole city. Thank you, Jackie. That. Uh, I personally appreciate that, and um, I will. I can comment later on in the meeting about Warfield Place, but we have other members of the public, so I'd like to keep the public comment. Uh, Carol, Carol Hor Horowitz. Yes, Carol yes. Horowitz. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I've just lived in Florence for the past two years, and so I'm kind of a newcomer to Northampton. But um, I'm a member of Climate Action now. And we have a subgroup that um, is called Regenerative um, Farming Forests and Food Systems. And um, really, I'm just coming to hear what you're doing. Um, and I like to get more involved in, you know, thinking about native native trees. Um, I know you have a whole process, and you probably know a lot more than I do, but. Um, I am a fan of planting native whenever possible. So I, I just came to see what you're doing and hear, um, and this might not be the time to discuss that, um, but at some point I'd like to find out, you know, what the plans are um, for the city and for, and whether you ha agree on, on promoting natives or, you know, just have a discussion. So that's all, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Christina Div Divigard, is that did I pronounce that correctly, Christina? Hope oh, you're on you're on mute. Oh, but yeah, two years of doing this Zoom thing, you think I'd got it figured out by now? <laughs> um, so hi everybody, I'm Christina. Um, 
I am in the process of really just figuring out how some of the decision making uh, regarding our natural surroundings is being um, addressed. I live at 79 Island Road and recently um, the city kind of came through and clear cutted a large swath of trees, native species, wildflowers, um, saplings planted by neighbors, and we um, are not really happy about it, very disappointed, um, and do not believe that there's any precedent for such um, uh, aggressive um, removal and destruction of um, of foliage and trees. So I'm not sure where to go to with this. Um, and I'm trying to just like figure out how to how to find out like the reasons why, what we might need to do to prevent it from happening again. Um, so here I am. So thank you for having me. Thank you for thank you for coming. Uh, Darcy, Darcy Sweeney. I don't know if you wanted to, during public comment, if you want. Hi, I'm also with Climate Action Now and very interested in tree preservation, um, making it harder even for private trees to be cut down. In, in my neighborhood for development a year ago, two really old, gorgeous maples, they were each well over a hundred years old, the kind of trees you really only find in cities now because our forests have been logged and they were cut so the developer could build, put in as many houses as possible. Uh, I mean, it, you know, he put in two, he could have just put in one. So I really, that is heartbreaking to me and to my neighborhood. And I hope that we can move forward in making it harder for especially developers to come in and cut down our massive, gorgeous trees that make Northampton such a nice place to live. I live in Bay State, by the way. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, yes, Jackie, your hand is raised. Y you're muted, Jackie. It's all right. Yes, I'm going. I have their emails. I'm going to send Carol and Darcy that article that you co-wrote, uh, Rich, about the trees in Massachusetts from the. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> no, I. I you have... don't. I'm going to send it to him because okay. you you spell it out that. This municipalities have the right to protect trees on private property. It says so in that document. I'm not sure which document you're referring to, but if you oh, could, I'll, why don't you send it to me and then I can just review it? That sure, would be sure, it has your name on it. Okay, well, if it has my name on it, then I, I, don't, I don't remember the title, I'm, my apologies. Okay, I'll find it or I'll put it in the chat. Are we still your, are we still your favorite commission if I can't remember? Absolutely. Something? Okay, good, all right, I hope so, okay. All right. If uh, no one else from the public has any other comments, thank you all for coming and give up. Uh, yes, Carol. Yeah. I'm sorry. I just have a question. Are uh, we allowed to ask questions when you're talking to like for clarification, if we don't know what you're talking about during this meeting? Uh, I, I'm typically uh, typically if it's if it's an agenda, if it's an agenda item that's on the agenda. Yes, I, I don't personally have an issue with it. And I don't believe the other commissioners do um, other. Um, City Council, for example, is a little more stringent mm -hmm, with public right. comment, but I think because we're a small body and it's not like we have 600 people on Zoom, I, I think it's it's fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sue, you're, you're muted, Sue. I wanna say I appreciate the interest people are showing in different topics that really overlap our work. And um, what is the process for maybe speaking to some of those, I was immediately thinking of um, ideas and suggestions. Rich, do you know, or does anybody know the protocol? I guess I don't I don't understand your question fully. So can you elaborate oh, meaning how-, how yeah, about we... regeneration, the section in the, in the um, sustainable Northampton plan that goes into that and just things I thought of about and about private trees where we are there's a lot of questions that came up in this public comments i was just wondering how we i mean i think if i think it would be fine if people in this particular meeting because there's multiple there's different folks here that have we all have the same interests obviously but different um different topics that 
revert to the same interests we all have. But it's, I think for this meeting in particular, if there's something that we're touching upon in our agenda that people from the public actually have interest in or need clarification, by all means, they can raise their hand. If the members of the public want to discuss something in particular, I would suggest that they reach out to me as the chair or Sue, who's the vice chair, um, would, to get it on as an agenda item for another meeting. Because we do meet twice a month, so we meet quite frequently. And we're always, we're always actually looking to have people come to our meetings and actually talk to us about uh, you know, different, different things that maybe are not our strong suit, you know, like uh, planting perennial plants, for example, I, I, I can identify them, but I'm not necessarily, it's not my strong suit, you know, that's Jen's strong suit, Jen's, that's what Jen has done her whole professional life. So we have a lot of talent on this commission. And I think all of us together could collectively help people that come to our meetings or at least to guide them in the right direction uh, or answer their questions. So uh, I'm, op I'm open to that. I mean, again, it's not like we have 500 people on this meeting asking 500 different questions. They're all really sort of related to everything we're talking about. Does that answer your question? Molly, you're muted. Yeah. Um, uh, as far as Christina's question, which was a fairly uh, concrete, short question, um, who should she contact about what happened? Um, we either quickly answer that here, or can you make sure to contact her after the meeting? Yep. yep, I will probably make it. I'll send you an email and probably make a time just to come down and talk to you. Probably would be the easiest thing to do if that's okay. Okay. Um, anyone else before we dive into the agenda? All right. Uh, yes, Jackie. You're muted again. I put the information in the chat. It's from 2021. It's called the Guide to Local Tree Bylaws okay. in Communities in Massachusetts. Okay. Thank um, you, Rich. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. I don't think I I might be quoted in there. I don't, although I did help them write some of that. I think maybe I, I don't remember. Even though it was last year, I apologize. Okay. All right. Thank yes. you. So I'm sending the link to Darcy and Carol. Okay. All right. Any other comments? Perfect. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Okay, um, review and approve minutes of 9-7-2022. I sent uh, everyone a packet. Did everyone have a chance to read them? I see two people saying yes. Is there anyone who needs to read them? Sue does, okay. Just let me know when you're, everyone's had a chance to review them and they're good to go. Uh, Rich, while we are reading, yes. um, I just, it just came to my mind about the, um, is the uh, planting guidelines still on the, um, on the website? Because some folks that were wondering about the, uh, you know the speak how we choose species yep. and all that kind of stuff that may be a helpful document yep. for them and that we are kind of in the process of redoing it but yeah, yeah. we had a we Michigan. had originally taken that down because we were editing it and i think i asked karen who was our gis coordinator to um put it back up so i'm just going to check and i'll let them know That document just has a lot of information in it. And uh... yes, it is is it is on there. Okay. What's the title of it again? Uh, uh, it's the tree list and planting guidelines. So that is, if you Google Northampton Urban Forestry Commission, did the name get changed? Uh, it's under the tree warden, actually. Okay. You can find it both ways. On the city see. website. Yeah, let's see if I can actually. I put it in the I put it in the chat, so you can everyone can pull it off of there. It's a it's a document to, to um, it's like a it's in a Google Doc form.
I'm done with a minute. Okay. Um, Sue is good. Rob, Rob, just waiting for Rob, I think. And, yeah. Or, there, I'm back. Okay, uh, uh, Rob, are you, are you okay with them? Mm -hmm. All right, David, are you still? Yep, I, I've read them. Okay, all right. Does uh, anyone have any suggested changes? additions, deletions. Okay, could I have a motion please to accept the minutes as presented? I'll move to accept the minutes as presented. It's Jen Werner. Could I get a second please? I will, Molly. All right, uh, there's a motion on the floor to accept the minutes as presented and has been seconded. Um, what, any discussion? No discussion. Bonnie, could you please do a roll call? I can, Rich. Uh, yes. Susan. Muted, but here. Molly. Yes. Jennifer. Sorry, yes. Okay. Rob. Yes. And David. Yes. Thank you. Ben, I think you skipped me. Yes. Oh, Jen. Yes. Yep. Gotcha. Um, all right. Awesome, thank you. All right, moving along, uh, chair, tree ward, chair report, tree warden report. So I would like to, Jackie mentioned Warfield Place. So I just wanna update um, the commission and members of the public. Um, we, the, myself, um, Stan Moulton, who is the ward one counselor, uh, uh, Sue Lofthouse and Rob Postal met with, I think eight, members of the Warfield, Warfield neighborhood yesterday at four o'clock in the afternoon. So uh, there were some people that live on Warfield Place did not participate and that was their choice and they chose not to and hopefully they will eventually um, would like to be involved, but if they're not, that's, that's, um, that's okay too. Um, but we met with the residents um, and we basically laid out a, a planting plan um, for the street to replant the street and we, uh, Rob, Sue, and I staked it after um, the folks were back, when they went back in their houses, we staked it and get prepped it for a dig safe. So we can actually make sure that the sites we staked uh, don't have any utility conflicts. Um, the meeting was uh, very cordial. Um, we're hoping to replace um, all of the cherry trees on that one side of the street because that side of the street all has structural soil in the tree belt and underneath the sidewalk. Um, this, the tree belt is a little narrow, narrower than um, we're used to planting in, but because of the CU soil, I think we'll be okay. Um, I think the difficult part will be actually getting the, the appropriate size grow bag for the narrower parts of the street so we actually don't have to dig such a large, um, you know, an existing hole that's twice the size. They're going to be more, some of them will be actually instead of round donuts, they'll be more kind of rectangles, but I think, it, I think it'll be all fine. And then uh, on the other side of the street, we picked, uh, we had one, two, three, four locations for um, medium to large trees that we think are suitable. And then we captured one setback while we were there. Hmm. So the, once we do the, um, once we do the uh, dig safe and I, the utility company comes out and marks everything, then I'll be able to really we, Rob and I might have to go back and move the stakes a little bit, but I think we, I think altogether it was 15, maybe 15 trees or 14 trees at this point. And then we're, we did talk to another homeowner who lives on the other leg of Warfield going to Fenn Street that has the new uh, uh, large white house that um, has an ample uh, tree belt area, um, but it's not public right away, it's private property. Mm -hmm. So we are hoping maybe to grab some setbacks there as well, um, so we could increase the, the street tree canopy. Um, we have some of the tree stock, some of the, the cherry trees. Um, I'm working with Amherst Nursery to get a, a quantity and a quote from them. Um, because they do have them, but some of them are field grown, some are in grow bags. So the goal would be to um, go back, look at the street, double check things, line up the tree stock, and then we're gonna hopefully pick a planting date in October late October, early November. 
to actually plant the plant the street and work with the neighbors uh, and you know hopefully and uh, the neighbors uh, we recommended they contact tree northampton and sign up as volunteers if they're interested in participating in the planting and that way there they could actually put their uh just their name in the or their uh you know that we live in warfield place in the comment section so we just know who who is who volunteering for what so um i don't know if i missed anything did i miss anything sue or rob no, I would add that you, in your invitation to the meeting, you also said if people can't or don't want to come to the meeting, you're also welcome to weigh in because there are, you know, this the residents are getting, um, you know, input on the on the species, on the street. Yep. It's not being, you know. Yeah. Yeah. No. That you're thank you. by the city, mind. the residents are. Yeah, this this is really all resident driven. And from what we heard from the residents we spoke with last night, they were all in favor of putting cherry trees back where the existing cherry trees were. And then for the non under non underwire side, which is the larger trees, um, we have a mul we gave them a multitude of species that they could pick from, um, and gave them locations to go and look uh, citywide where those trees already exist whether they're trees we've planted in the last five years or whether they're trees that were planted before our time that are quite mature, like the hackberry on, mm. on street, et cetera, something like that. So, so I mean, I, it was, a, it was a really great meeting. Um, and I'm looking forward to working with the residents and I'm, I'm looking forward to public input by, by everyone. Um, I mean, that was the purpose of the meeting and meeting in person on the street. Um, and you know, I was impressed that some of the residents had actually learned what structural soil is and permeable pavement, flexi pave, and you know they were very positive about getting trees going, and they obviously spent time thinking about it because the structural soil and flexible pavement is rather unique in our town. There's only a couple other places that have it, mm -hmm. but it will afford healthier trees on a street with such you know small tree belts as a lot of the little streets tend to have jen and that's the structural soil in particular is something we've worked as a commission and uh very hard to um bring that as a technology into northampton and i feel like this is a big success to be able to um you know, we don't have to go into a big diatribe about what structural soil is, but it uh, for urban uh, conditions, it's uh, key to, um, you know, getting away from the typical tree pits and that don't really work. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's great to see it more integrated in another location. So yeah, I'm, I, I agree. And I'll just say that I think that using structural soil and porous pavement is going to be is an industry standard and it's been used in past public works projects and also uh, projects that were approved by the planning board um, throughout the city. But I, I see it going forward as um, something that is, you know, a line item in every contract because there are for paving projects. And this goes back to the conflict that we have with complete streets, which we can talk about at another length at another meeting. But I think that you'll see the use of structural soil uh, and retrofitting a lot of uh, mature trees and retrofitting some of the trees we've planted that have grown um, when actually doing sidewalk uh, slash roadway replacement. I, I don't see any way of getting around it. Um, I don't think it's um, the ideal way to deal with things is to you know, just decide that we're just going to remove trees just for the sake of pavement. Um, you know, and of course, in this case, what happened it happened, and we can't change that, but we can learn from that and move forward and try to model something that um, works better uh, and uh, is satisfactory to everyone. I guess is where I'm going with that. So, uh, Jackie, you're you're muted, Jackie. Okay. I just want to say that I'm so glad to hear that you're going to replace the cherry trees with cherry trees. I, I think that should go a long way to healing the trauma that that neighborhood suffered. Thank you so much. Um, all right, so I have one other thing um, that I, for my chair report. So I want to do a little quick screen share. Now if I can just, now that I've done, 
I can't see. One of the things when I have the live transcription on, there it is, okay. There's a question in chat, um, yeah. but we're not supposed to really document anything in chat because of open meeting. Yep, that's fine. Carol, I see your question. Are you going to plant native cherry trees? And the answer to your question is I have to determine, we have to determine what's available um, from the nursery stock. That's the driver. So we will make an attempt to, but it depends upon what nursery stock is. The trees that were there were Kwanzan, Kwanzan cherries. Um, so those are what the, some of the nurseries have. Um, but that's sort of where we're we're at go ahead you're, you're muted okay. i know um i'm just wondering if um what the urgency and i mean do you ever get trees from native plant trust nasami farm they have native you know they have native trees and they have i think reasonable prices and they probably don't have anything right now but they could in the spring i don't know when you're planting but it just seems like I hope you, I, and I, I, I don't know your process. I don't know anything. So excuse me if I'm, you know, asking you things that you already know, but they have a great book too. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's native, native trees for new of new England. I forget the name of it. I have it, but um, so I just feel like, you know, cherries I know are a really important, like a keystone tree, but if you plant uh, cherry trees that aren't native, they're not really serving biodiversity. They're not really serving birds and insects even close to the way that natives would. So I just would ask you to not, um, I, I don't know how, if you're tied to certain sources and you have to purchase from certain sources or if you have the ability to wait, but I would ask you to please consider that. I, if I could just help out here a bit. So I'm Rob and I've worked with Rich a great deal on sourcing trees. That's one of the things I do is uh, find actual stock in the nurseries and uh, make recommendations for, to Rich about what to, what we can plant, what's available. And um, I work with Tree Northampton also, as does Sue Lofthouse here. And I think that the questions you're asking would be very lengthy to answer. But if you want to contact Tree Northampton, uh, that would be really good. And then we can have a, a real discussion that would help help you understand what the city of Northampton is, is, is doing along with Tree Northampton, who are the volunteers. So it's a volunteer organization called Tree Northampton. It's under treenorthampton.org. And uh, we're very involved. Northampton at gmail.com. Is the way to contact, or you can go to treenorthampton.org. There's a website. Get in touch with us because, as Rob said, it, there's a number of layers in the process and the decision making, and um, we'd be happy to talk to you about it. Yeah, so we've been working on it for 10 years, like over, it's something we work on endlessly, and uh, we're advised by. Department of Conservation and Recreation, the University of Massachusetts. A lot comes from Cornell University. Uh, it's uh, Rich is it arborist who keeps up on urban arboriculture, and so some of it just comes directly from him. But all these different sources we're working with to help advise on which trees to plant. That's how we. That's how we get there. And city tree wardens have a have a group, Massachusetts Tree Wardens Association, and they combine their um experiences and tips as well that's been a source of knowledge okay and it's, we're more a volunteer organization like climate action i mean like i'm not saying we're like them i'm saying as is climate action and so uh knowing other organizations that are, have the same interest as we do or, or overlapping interests is valuable to us so please please be in touch again my name is rob and so Put that in the in the note. Thanks. Thank you, Rob. Um, so hopefully, Carol will be able to answer some of your some of your questions. And feel free to reach out to me directly if you like as well uh, via email. Um, my email is on the Tree Wardens website. It's our parcel at northhamptonma.gov. 
Um, so quickly, I know we're a little over time, but I just wanted to, I'm, I, I got uh, somewhat excited today because I was able to um, participate in a planting. Oh. And so sort of unexpected. All right. Can everyone see that? Mm -hmm. oh, yes. Well, oh, hopefully I can move this now. I see a firehouse. You see what? The firehouse. I see where that is. Yeah. Carlin. Okay. So this is Carlin. This is Carlin Drive. Um, and of course now yeah. it's going to be, hold on, sorry. I don't know if I can move this forward or not, but I have. So what I, what I wanted to show you is that, um, <clears throat> this was a project that the, uh, that was started, that was set in motion prior to the pandemic. So in 2019, this, you can't see the parking lot uh, to the right of these gentlemen, but this is a large parking lot that was constructed um for the fire department and also for their because it's a regional headquarters and regional training center so um there were uh, ash trees along this edge right here that all had emerald ash for that were taken down as part of this project so what i was able to do is i was able to work with the contractor um the contractor worked for the city and tie and bond the engineering firm to replace um all the all the trees so we got a net gain of uh Let's see, there's one, two, three, four. I think we got like a net gain of probably almost uh, 10 trees out of this project. So let me just see if I can, for some reason, because I just did that. Hold on a second. What kind of trees are they? So this, what we're looking at right in front of us is a black gum. Um, in the background with that gentleman standing right there is a London plane tree um, in the, with that gentleman with the orange shirt on, um, that's a, a, a American uh, sweet gum, species sweet gum. And way over is a, um, a, is a uh, Sergeant Cherry. Um, and then let me see if I can. And black gum and the sweet gum are natives. Yes, yep. Yeah. So for some reason I can't seem to advance. Uh, nope, that's not where I want. Oh. Advance to another slide. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not able to do it for some reason. Hold on a second. Mm -hmm. When I, I, I have to like um, select all the slides and then do um, show. So hold on one second. Let me stop sharing the screen. Hold on. Just, I just got a couple other things. So basically, what ended up happening is that uh, because I've been working with them, um, they wanted me to come over and actually just kind of show them how to plant. So this turned into like an organic planting seminar or lesson or whatever you like to call it between these contractors and myself who have planted many trees. They're Mass West construction. They did a lot of plantings in the back of Pulaski Park. Um, so it ended up being that I spent a good part of the morning with them um, taking apart all because they were all b, b trees, which, by the way, I was able to go to the nursery and select myself as part of this project which was also um, um, a, a good thing. And then um, we ended up, basically I ended up showing them the process, how to plant a B&B &B tree from the beginning to end. Um, and they really had no, they were very gracious and they were very accepting of um, the process that we, I go through and that we go through together. But they were like, you know, we, we, we don't, we would take the burlap off. Sometimes we take the wire off, sometimes we don't but we would never clean off the top of the ball. We would just kind of brush it off a little bit and set it to grade and that was it. So every tree except two, which were the London, the uh, Blood Good London plane trees, were all had about six to eight inches of material on top of them. Um, so it really was a, um, it really was like a win-win um, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Um, let me just that education is critical. Yay. Well, I, you know, that yeah, multiplies. Again, it was um, it was just like organic. So it just it wasn't really anything um, planned. No, it was it was nothing. It was nothing planned. So now that I've done that, I've lost my screen share. Hold on one second. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me see if I can, I'll give you, I'm gonna do one more photo and then we'll move on. And then I know we have, uh, so here is a, here's a, a the liquid ambar uh, that actually you can see where my cursor is. That's where the soil was. 
Oh. So, you know, again, a uh, huge waste of material from the nursery. I feel bad for the nursery that paid for the soil, but they charged, I think, $300 per tree. That's what these cost. Um, and then they, you know, they had a hydro seeder there that they used and they, they soaked them twice. And then they went and made uh, the donuts around them. And are they going to bring back mulch tomorrow? Were they, were they surprised about the donuts instead of volcano mulching? No. Well, I talked about volcano mulching with them. Um, they actually, um, they do the donuts, um, but I think they do the saucers um, probably a little more come tightly that can turn into volcano mulch. So I just, you know, and they, they pre-dug all these holes yesterday with their, with their piece of machinery they had, and they ended up actually, the majority of the holes were too deep. So, so we had to, you know, reshape them. And then when I got there, they had like three trees in the hole. I'm like, I said, let's go over to the tree that's out of the hole and let's mess with this one. And I took it all apart with them. And then once they saw that, they yanked all the other trees out and they did it the same way. And they did every single one of them the same way. They manually took them apart, mm. figured out where the flare was, reshaped the holes. And then they rolled them all in by hand and stood them up, taught them about trying to make the fan um, you know, go parallel to the roadway. Of course, in this situation, it's not really that critical because of there's a large island there. So, um, so it all it was great. It was the organic. It's just the, the foreman on the job said, "Well, I don't. You weren't supposed to work today." And I'm like, "Well, I, I can't show you how to do this without getting dirty." <laughs> the guy who was a foreman, he's a part of the owner of the company. He's a very nice man. He's done a lot of work in Northampton over the, his 40 year career. So it was, it was, it made me feel really good and gave me hope that this organic conversation with contractors, I think is some, it's almost like you have to skip and, and I don't mean to be insulting to any of the guests that are on our show, on our meeting, if you're engineers, but it's almost like you have to sort of skip the engineers um, that actually oversee these projects because you really, this is really drives home for me how important it is to have an arborist on site when you're doing this kind of work. There's just, I mean, so I, and I said to the owner, I'm saying, look, I said, if you planted these trees at the depth that you were going to, I said, these trees would have died and you would have had to come back and replace them. I said, so that takes out of your bottom line of, of what you, the project you're working on. I said, you know, so they, they were very, they were very gracious. And I think you, it makes a lot of sense to them when you talk dollars and cents in essence, when they start to bid projects. Um, but again, there's a whole, there's a whole host of, there's a whole bunch of contractors out there that are actually really interested in learning to do things the right way. And today gave me a lot of hope and it came very unexpected. So I just wanted to share it with you. I'm sorry, we're way over time, but um, that is, Sue, so you're- I hope they take pride when they go by that site. Uh, I, 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 think, I think they will. I mean, they work all over the state. They're, they're um, you know, so yeah. I, I hope so. Um, but. So with that said, that was that was part of my day today and part of yesterday's day. So I've kind of given you a rundown. We're way over. Um, we're probably not going to get to everything on the agenda, but the next item is the STO discussion. So I um, sent you the draft um, that we reviewed last week. I also sent you the original draft that we sent to planning and sustainability back in May, June. Um, and, um, since then, I hope you have time to look at both of them. Um, David, um, really wrote a very thoughtful email to all of us with a lot of, um, great information in it and, you know, made me, I had to read it twice, made me think about a lot of things about what we're doing and how we're doing them. And I, I don't know where you want to begin this conversation. Um, and I will leave that to you. I, I think it's a, sort of an open conversation because I think David's email brings up a lot of uh, interesting things that are not necessarily addressed by the existing STO in either form, whether it's the form we wanted to present to uh, that we'd like to see enforced or planning's version. So um, I definitely don't think we're going to probably vote on this this evening because we have a whole bunch of questions and comments. So. I don't know if David if, or Molly, you know, you want to start the conversation? Well, first of all, has everybody read David's um, email? Yes. I, I'm not sure that I got it. 
Uh, now look, how long ago did it get sent? Uh, I sent it this morning. So. Oh, this morning. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty recent. Okay, well, I, I was out out and about today, so now I'll look for it. Um, what I would like to do, I mean, I could start off the conversation unless David wants to say something else besides what he already wrote. Got it. But I um I read it and I wrote up some comments right on the document, which I could put on a screen share so you could see the document and the comments that I added to it. But would that be a reasonable That's place great. to start? Yeah, Molly, you're you're a co-host, so go ahead. Okay. Good. Okay, so the black is what David wrote, and the blue and the red is what I wrote. Um, let me just move this up a little bit. Um, all right, the red is just a changing in wording that I was suggesting. I just said, um, instead of um, saying by offering STO amendments that are meaningfully different from what planning and sustainability would propose. Um, what we're trying to do is offer amendments that align with our mission of protecting the, it's not that we're necessarily trying to oppose the PSO, we're just trying to um, protect the urban forest canopy. Um, and <clears throat> at issue is how much we should compromise with the Planning and Sustainability Office in the interest of reaching an agreement. And I was just wondering, do we have a mission statement? Uh, that is a good, I believe we have a mission statement. The mission statement is in our, in our charge at, in the administrative code. So. As our, well, it would be good to review that as we really got to, what is our purpose? Is our purpose to, you know, protect the tree canopy or is it to, you know, work with other departments to, you know, find solutions that are in the best interest of the city or whatever, you know, I don't know how it's, how mm -hmm. it's worded. That would kind of affect how we would approach it. But um, just something, maybe we could look at that at some point, but um, so I said, um, Okay, so David's talking about the single family by right loophole um, and about the developers in Bay State um, and, and the proposal of um, like what to do about trees that are off of city property that are on private land. And um, the STO that's before us was never, I wrote, was never as ambitious as proposing to protect trees that people can currently remove by right. Those trees are not even under the purview of the UFC, whether we want them to be or not. How feasible is it politically to put limits on which trees can be cut by right on private property? That's like a whole other area. And you know, the STO really isn't about that. It's about a very narrow number of the trees in the city. And you know, really <laughs> when you think about STO, I think it should be, you know. Well, it, in this case, it's defining what is called, what is considered to be significant, which is really something that came from the planning board or they, they changed what we originally said. Um, so I have a quick question. So if there was a group of people, so we, our scope is limited to, as a commission to public shade trees, public trees. Um, that's my understanding. Uh, so if there was a group of people in the community that was interested in taking on um, uh, whatever, an another ordinance or whatever, you know, to include uh, some consideration of private trees, like how would they go about that? Would they go to their own city councilor and say, we're concerned about this. We want some type of city legislation that's going to protect large private trees. Because, right? Because we don't really are our purview, purview yeah. is not private trees. I mean, we care about them, but Rich, were you? Yeah, I, I just wanted to piggyback on what 
Molly and Jen, you were just were talking about. So our charge is the Urban Forestry Commission preserves, protects, and promotes city shade trees. Hmm. The That's interesting. Does that mean city owned or in the city? Well, <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. The commission advises and assists the tree warden and mayor in researching and developing plans, programs, and policies for achieving tree canopy that supports Northampton goals, Northampton's goals of public health, beautification, economic and environmental sustainability, and resilience in the face of climate change. Period. Hmm. The commission reviews and makes recommendations on ordinance and zoning regulations related to trees. So we could we could make a recommendation of an ordinance about private trees if we wanted to. So it receives and reviews input from city residents, businesses, and neighborhoods on issues or concerns related to trees, makes planting and maintenance recommendations guided by industry best practices, and works to promote knowledge and awareness of the benefit of an actively managed urban forest. So that's our that is our charge. That that's we actually wrote that. Um, when the Urban Forestry Commission was changed from the Tree Commission, that we changed the charge. We added, I think Lily, I can't remember, Lily and Marilyn worked on it. I, I don't, and I don't remember. I wasn't the chair at the time, so it was before that. But that's, you know, the way that I'm reading that, commission reviews and makes recommendations on ordinance and zoning regulations as it relates to trees, related to trees, and also reviews input from city residents, businesses, and neighborhoods on issues or concerns related to trees. So Jen, to answer your question, um, I would by reading this, I would say that if if uh, folks are interested in, in understanding uh, private tree protection above and beyond the STO, then they would come to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They they definitely could communicate with their counselor. Mm -hmm. You know, I, mean, I, I don't. I think this would be the place to start. That's my that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. Back to Molly, what Molly was okay. saying. On, you know, is it our job to work with other groups in the city, other departments? I guess I understand it as you want to have movement forward and you can either, you know, we could lobby the mayor and get the mayor to introduce new ordinance language that would protect private trees, or we could um, work with city councilors and try to get them behind it. Um, there's always going to have to be some interface with planning department, though, I believe and their goals. So we might have competing goals is what happens. It's not that we have to work with them, but to get anything done, you there's only so many paths. Does that, is that, the, is that what other people see it as to the different paths yeah. for change? Yeah, I mean, to put it another way, we have the ear in theory of the mayor but they're also listening to other commissions. And so to the extent that we can be um, in sync with other commissions and not, and not, not uh, on the other end of things, it's more likely that we'll see our goals made into, our goals reached. I mean, uh, we don't wanna be, uh, we don't want, we, it, it would be good to avoid us having one set of goals and another commission having another set um, because then it's not clear that the mayor would follow our suggestions. Um, so I think it's really nice that we communicated with and worked with um, the Marilyn on this, right? Marilyn, uh, was that Rich who it was, Marilyn? You taught, you're uh, thinking of Carolyn. Carolyn. Carolyn Mish. Carolyn Mish, yeah, Carolyn Mish. I think that that, that that makes the recommendation much stronger and more likely to be adopted by the mayor. Uh, if we go in a different kind of branch off from that, then um, it just slightly diminishes or more than slightly diminishes the, the weight of our recommendations, I think. And the likelihood that will anything will change at all. Yeah, yeah. I think. Exactly, Sue. So it's just a, I'm just saying what you just said, Sue, but in a slightly different way. I, you've articulated it a little more clearly. Rich, just to, to yeah. clarify, um, there is. Am I correct that there is no uh, mass general law? 
well, there's mass general law that protects public trees. Correct. Pu but pu there, public there, trees and park trees. Right. But there is no mass general <laughs> law currently that protects large private trees. No, the only the only um, the only strange caveat to that. No, there is no MGL of any kind that protects private trees. There's only MGL case law that um, sort of guides uh, neighbors and trees. So if you and I were neighbors and we had a conflict about a tree, there's case oh. law about that, but that has nothing that there's no municipal enforcement. It's just between two people because Massachusetts has the uh, recognizes the right to self-help. So if, if we were going to do our own local uh, tree protection ordinance, so similar to Cambridge, it would be a local ordinance that would be on our books that would be have to be enforced by someone within the city. So there's- and David, no. how, did, how did Cambridge accomplish that, that? Do you know? I don't know, but that's that's why I think it would be valuable to get Andrew Putnam um, I, as a guest to address the commission. Mm -hmm. Sorry. That's all right. I just want to, can I finish just um, saying what I have in lieu? Because that's what I would be saying in response. Anyway, I wrote, because Cambridge is, I think, uniformly densely developed, it doesn't have the same issue of whether to prioritize development in one area over another. Also, are there even many trees there that are not in the public right of way? I'm thinking that except for the university campus, it's mostly buildings and roads with not much in the way of yards. And I wonder, is Harvard University subject to the tree protection ordinance? Actually, as a 50 year resident of Cambridge, I can say there are a lot of trees in a lot of yards in Cambridge. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. all right. Uh, it's, it's at least one of which I planted or two. Okay. <laughs> like, like 50 years ago. All right. Good to know. <laughs> um, then down here, I say the assumption and the whole premise behind the STO is that more development downtown is better than retaining trees, is better than retaining trees there because it incentivizes downtown versus peripheral development. Perhaps the UFC should evaluate our own position on this. Does downtown development actually promote Northampton's overall tree canopy by preventing? development of more rural treed areas? In other words, does downtown development actually mean that trees in the outlying areas won't be developed? And which is more important, preserving overall tree canopy in the city limits, if the STO even accomplishes this at all, we don't know if it's gonna work, or preserving trees for shade and other benefits in the most densely developed and hardscape downtown zones? I hate to see an 18 inch tree in the core business district taken down without consequences, but maybe that is outweighed by the trees saved in the outer zones. Another assumption is that the fines imposed for removing trees under the STO will be sufficient to have the intended effect. So that's it. Those are my comments. And that's kind of the crux of it. We don't have data exactly but it only stands to reason that if it makes it expensive to build where there's a lot of trees on the edge of town that they won't do that and if i don't know what do other people think so rob, I, go ahead go ahead rob, don't you have um information on um like i remember you talking before about the importance of contiguous forest land, or which would kind of be on the outside of, on the outskirts of Northampton as providing um, more services than very large trees in a particularly urban area. I, I know what you're referring to, and I can't remember the, the, the group or study involved, but there, there's a very uh, intense effort to have contiguous forest because it acts as a pathway for wildlife and and um uh it's somehow yeah i can i can talk about that i just yeah. you want to have unfragmented forest right it doesn't have roads like in and among it yeah so the unfragmented forest is is important but also uh, just that last line about whether it would have the effect or not have the effect 
I, I think the, uh, the the ordinance in terms of protecting trees, the, it's there is a two sides to it that as to what the effect is. If the fine is large enough and people are willing to pay it, it's not that the STO didn't have a positive effect because it, it puts money, I think, I'm not sure where the money goes, but I'm hoping it goes towards trees. Is that Rich, do you know? Where? It, it goes towards tree replacements on city property. Yeah, so so in, in a way, it, it, although you might prefer the tree, depending on the size of the fine, you might prefer the money. Uh, I know when uh, the uh, solar panels went up in that big solar farm, Rich, yeah. that built, um, you know, a really substantial check got written. Um, and so that that had a positive effect on the canopy in, in another way. You remember that? It was like $38,000 or something, yeah. Uh, the, the, that was for public shade trees. So what you're referring to is the Willard, uh, the where the Willard gravel bank used to be. Yeah. That was checked for $300,000. 300,000. 300,000, yes. And that went to the Office of Planning and Sustainability because they actually manage the funds that are generated. Oh, okay. yeah. Well, I'm just saying that we, we are setting up a system where where money and, and trees can be exchanged. And there is some logic to that. At some point, it's worth giving up the tree for enough money for tree to, to grow the forest in other places. I would add to that, either grow the forest in other places or save the forest in other places. Yeah. So I think the whole, the, you know, the trade-off, so we're, it's like we're trying to, it's like the STO is round and um, the by right, protection of trees on private property is square you know we're trying to sort of stick them in the same hole and we can't because the sto is our our local planning board has the ability to draft this ordinance and be approved by the city council presently um, by right construction for example um, can happen anywhere in the city and i could go to Leeds and buy 20 acres of property and i could cut down all the trees mm -hmm. in one house so the STO is just limited to the, you know, what we've been, the site plan review, et cetera, all over the city. So as far as the STO goes, having a, a smaller um, DBH um, replacement in the outer edges of the city is, is wonderful because what it does is it prevents people from wanting to develop out there that have projects that have to have site plan review or special permit. It pushes people to actually develop property closer to the center of the urban city, this, the urban center, because the DBH is, um, the DBH is greater. Um, and also there are less trees typically in the center of the city versus on the outskirts. So what I think the issue is, is that I think we have to decide as a commission, do we want to, do we want to, you know, work on the STO and get it passed and then actually dive into trying to develop a local tree ordinance that would do by right, basically can do everything else that's not covered by the STO. Or as, I, and I don't wanna speak for David, but I believe as David alludes to in his email, the way I interpret it is, you know, maybe we should think about, I guess maybe not passing the S STO, even though it feels like we should pass it. Um, maybe we should actually just talk about having a general ordinance that protects all trees, whether they're on private property um, and, and by, for by right construction and for development. So it would be one ordinance and the SDO wouldn't need to exist any longer. And that's where I think the information that Cambridge has actually, what Cambridge has done would be very helpful to us Although I, I agree with Molly, Cambridge obviously, and Rob can attest to this. Cambridge is a different footprint than Northampton. Um, it has different uh, different size canopy, different size square footage. They have different zoning regs, but I mean the by right construction is the same everywhere in the Commonwealth because those are all um, general mass general laws. So I, I mean, so my my, I'm just wondering if we don't if we just sit on the STO for now and actually listen to what. Um, Andrew Putnam has to say in Cambridge and maybe think bigger and, and maybe we, we recommend a different ordinance that protects everything and not the STO or we recommend the STO move along 
and then recommend a different ordinance that protects everything else. And David, again, I don't want to speak for you. You wrote a really nice email, and I think we should give David some time to just kind of give us his thoughts. If Molly, you had your hand up. There. I just have a question. Am yeah. I correct in thinking that right now, before this STO goes into effect, well, is there an STO now, or is there is there any kind of protection for the trees that are in this um, special permit category? Yes, the protection that exists for anything that's on site plan review special permit is by the existing STO. And that has smaller diameters, right? It has the same diameter throughout the whole city. Bigger, yes. so less the, replacement yeah. value. So the, the, the diameter is 20 inches and the replacement value is ah. $100 per caliper inch, only at half. Okay. Age. So the question is like, if we pass it now, it's better than what we, if we pass a new one, it's better than what we already have. But if, um, you know, if we wait, you know, maybe we won't, if we wait, maybe we won't get the better than what we already have. I'm I think also, it. if you, if you wait and, and include private trees, I think you're very likely to, to potentially get such, such a great pushback that you lose on both fronts. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. So I see the, like incremental, like tr get this, whether modified you know, or not, as David has written about modifying it. And then once you have that, then try for the next goal, which is private trees. Because otherwise you might end up, yeah, with less than nothing. Yeah. D David, you, you muted yourself again. Do you want, I really would like, I would like to hear from David. Yeah, me too. Um, his email and his thoughts. My, my uh, internet connection is a little bit unstable, but so if I blank out, that's why. But uh, th thank you so much, all of you, for engaging so thoughtfully with it. Um, my, my, uh, I think my feeling is that the, there, there's been sort of, there's insufficient attention paid in the existing ordinance to the services that trees provide, the particularly stormwater mitigation services. Um, and I think by focusing on those, uh, well, it doesn't. It, 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 Molly's raised good questions about really our brief as a commission. Are we responsible? What, what exactly is our mission? Are we responsible for public shade trees or for proposing? Uh, hold on a sec. Um, sort of more, uh, even more protective ordinances. Um, hold on, my daughter is speaking to me here. All right, sorry, you all. Um, anyhow, what? Uh, but I, I feel I, I, I do think that that we that we that we should potentially pay more attention to the services that trees provide and really try to get that into the ordinance. But I'm all in favor of passing something that's more protective than what we have now, even if it means um adopting what carolyn and the, the office of uh, planning office is suggesting and then going for a cambridge model down the road i think that that's that would be a wise course jen i just really think in particular particular you're thinking about stormwater mitigation um uh, relating to permeable pavement, that was very, very interesting um, concept, you know, and that certainly, if there was a financial benefit to that for a developer or a ha or whoever to save a large tree because their, you know, sewer and water bill would, they could sell it, you know, sell that house on the, you know, oh, this is a, you know, net zero house, but it also, you're not going to, your water and sewer is going to be decreased by blah, blah, because you have retained this tree. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I thought that was really, really interesting way to think about it. So that, that really, I don't know, but I thought that was uh, particularly, uh, I think we could go somewhere with that. My, might I suggest that um, in this, in the near future, we have Doug McDonald, who is the city stormwater manager, actually come to one of our meetings to talk about that. Because Doug can really give you some details on how the stormwater formula 
um, where it's generated from and how it's used. Um, I, and I believe that I've had this conversation with Doug, but unfortunately the present stormwater um, model that they use that is a, a state model that's required does not, um, there's no applicability for uh, water uptake for trees. So, I mean, right, we have the ability by using iTree, for an example, to figure out how much, how much, how many gallons of water a tree uses in, in, in a year. It's not that difficult. Um, and I actually think it would be a huge incentive for developers if they recognize that they didn't have to do all this stormwater modeling or very large retention areas or um, other uh, mitigation for the stormwater runoff from some of these larger projects, if that was part of the you know, if you plant 500 trees, they're going to take up X amount of gallons of water, which negates, or if you're going to save 500 trees, and I'm just using those random numbers, it's going to, you know, prevent um, so many gallons of stormwater runoff into the Mill River or into the Connecticut River eventually. But I mean, I, I think, I think you all really bring up really very thoughtful and really have put, we've all put so much thought into this process. Um, and I kind of agree with David as much as I, as much as like this, the, the ordinance right now is like a carrot, it's dangling in front of us. It's like, yeah, we should, you know, we, we're there, we just get it passed. But I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily know if, I, I don't think we have enough information. I don't know. I, I just feel like we don't have enough information. Or we could say we are going to pass it in this iteration or we, we make some recommended changes, but we're coming back. We will be back. So, you know, you will send whatever changes we make, whatever changes we can work with on planning sustainability. We put a cover letter on it that says, these are the, this ordinance, you know, basically passes muster with us. However, and we will be back to discuss X, Y, and Z. And then we have to really put our, you know, our, our thinking caps on. Jen. Um, what's the precedent? I'm just thinking about workload. Like we really handle, you know, we're doing all these plantings and um, what's the precedent for, um, let's say a nonprofit like Climate Action Now to, you know, to do some of the, the behind the scenes work and then run it through us do you know what i'm trying to say yeah. like is there precedent for that happening in you know other zoning board or what are the conservation commission um, or you know what i'm saying oh so like for example uh main street for everyone mm -hmm. that's a good example that is a um a group of people that banded together mm. that created this really amazing did a lot of amazing work and brought a lot of interesting information to the main street redesign process that actually is incorporated into it some of it's not some of it is um so it is you know and that's a whole public process which you know that that will be approved eventually by the mayor uh the mayor will make the final approval of that so i mean that there definitely is ways for us to partner mm -hmm. with um volunteer organizations to get this type of thing done mm -hmm. you know because i we are I agree with you. We we have a we wear a lot of hats and we're all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, and just I, the expertise of some, yeah, you know what I mean? No, some I mean, of the I, science I, and stuff. Yeah, I agree with you. And and some of the folks from Climate Action Now, and I think Lily is a member of Climate Action Now as well. You know, brought a lot of great information about what other communities are doing across the country, and also people on energy and sustainability which is another commission I think that would be, we would be interesting to meet with them or have some kind of partner meeting with them <clears throat> because a lot of the things that we're talking about, they're talking about the same thing in energy and sustainability in regards to building construction, uh, in regards to heating, cooling, um, which all, and stormwater mitigation, everything that we're talking about, uh, ele electrifying, um, you know, city buildings, city fleet, they're all tied into what we're doing because what we're trying to do is preserve the natural, the natural forces or the natural world that we have. Um, and they are also coming from the other side and trying to upgrade and preserve and renew, um, you know, uh, the different energies that people use to heat their homes to re basically all to reduce the carbon footprint that we all have. 
So I think there's places that we could get a lot of expertise information from. The question is, where do we, how do we want to proceed from here? Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not totally sure. I mean, I know that I like to see the STO completed and done with, um, and then we can, but I think we need to say, yeah, we're, this is finished, but we're not done. We're, we'd like to come back and examine how you have, uh, we like to examine how other communities have actually implemented um, citywide ordinance that protects trees. And, and you know, th there, there's no fee, like I, I think in Cambridge, there's no fee associated with a removal. Like, I don't, I, I know there is a fee. There's a small fee. I can't remember what it is. This is why I think it would be good to have um, Andrew Putnam come and talk to us um, next month to talk about that and, and all the other questions that David and Molly raised in that, um, the email. So I don't know, what would you like to do? Or how would you like to proceed, I should say? David, do you have any thoughts? Uh, well, Ka uh, Carol asks a good, a good question, but you set up a subcommittee and ask for volunteers to work with you. It would be headed by someone on the commission. Uh, yes, we yes, we could do that. It would have to be, um, it would have to be public meetings. So you'd have to, we'd have to, do a subgroup meeting, have to be posted. Um, and then I don't see any reason why folks from Climate Action Now couldn't participate in the meeting. You know, but everything that is, <clears throat> it just has to be careful about open meeting law. So everything that is discussed um, has to be discussed at that meeting. Um, so if, for example, if one of us was, if, if one of us or two of us who are on the subgroup had a conversation with someone from Climate Action Now outside of the public meeting, and that information was brought up to the public meeting to be voted on, that's where things get a little gray about open meeting law violations. So, you know, I, I believe we've done this in the past. So I, I don't see an issue with it. Thank you, Carol. But again, I guess- the So I think what I'm hearing you say, Rich, is that we um, get this moved through and be vocal about the fact that this is a this is a start. We'll work with you on this as a start, and we want a lot more. Yeah, I mean, we I mean, I we can we can do that, or we can sit on it, and we can actually do a little more homework and see what other municipalities are up to in, in Northampton. Go ahead, uh, hi Molly. Go how ahead. hard is it to change? How hard it is to change an ordinance like? Let's say if we come back in two years and we've been doing some thinking about, you know, uh, private trees or whatever, and it relates to um, this ordinance, how hard would it be to change, let's say, some of those numbers in a table? Um, what kind of process is involved in changing an ordinance? Um, you actually, you have to have a crafted ordinance on, upon recommendation by the mayor. Or by someone, in, or by some legislator in the city, or one of the city council members, that would go in front of the council and it would be referred out to ordinance committee for review, to make sure it passed muster, um, and then um, it would end up actually um, going through a public hearing process. Might be changed in between that process because of public comment. Might might never get voted on. It might uh, get voted on. You know, so again, the STO that we have in front of us may get may get changed after we really after we let it go. Mm. So in the public process, counselors can make um, recommended amendments to um, to the to the ordinance based on you know constituency issues, anything, and then the ordinance could not look the same. So that is, and then that, that's where we're afforded a public comment because then, you know, once it's out of our purview, then we have the ability to make public comment. We can write letters, we can go to the public meetings, et cetera, um, go to the city council meetings. But again, it's once it leaves our hands, it's subject to change like any legislation that, you know, we're aware of uh, countrywide basically. But I guess in, in terms of this, you know, whether I think we should say yes to this existing ordinance um, with the new edits in it, um, 
The thing that really gives me pause is the 20 inch diameter in the core business district. Mm -hmm. And I haven't looked on a, our survey to see um, how many trees that size there actually are. Do you have any idea in the core business district? Uh, no, you would have the way we'd have to filter. I, I could filter it. It would take me a bit, but I, I can try to do that. Let me make a little note for myself. If there aren't any trees in that area anyway, then it doesn't really matter. But um, that's a great point, Molly. I would rather have that number be, say, 15, the same as the U, R, A, U, whatever, U, A, B, and C. Um, 20, just, you know, to take out a, you know, a 19 inch tree in the middle of downtown, that just seems terrible. <laughs> And it's a cross purposes with the stormwater mitigation, like with the whole green infrastructure strategy. So. Right. Because these huge storms that are flooding places, you know, that's probably our biggest threat from the meetings I've gone to on resiliency for Northampton. And heat. I'm thinking of heat as well. Yeah, somebody, Carol just mentioned it as well. That's where you most need the shade is downtown. And little trees don't provide shade. <laughs> no no they don't and and just um I, I will filter it but i'm only going to give you 20 inch trees that are in the public right away yeah that's what i'm wondering about okay, so the sto doesn't apply to those trees but it, oh, it will give you that's true but, uh, right. but it will also give you a sense of how many 20 inch trees we have in an inventory i don't know if that'll help you but um it doesn't i can't give you what's on private property accurately anyways um you know, and, I, and I, that's I, true. You don't have that info. I mean, my, my my sense is, sorry if I'm talking a lot, but my sense is I don't think we're ready to vote on this tonight. So that's I think we, <laughs> I think just we, a little point. Carolyn, Carolyn's choosing numbers and and putting, you know, she's. She's putting herself behind these numbers and, you know, insisting on them. Is there a reason? Is there something she knows that, you know, we do? I mean, does she know how many trees are involved or she is a uh, guess from her point of view or? I think it's really driven by, um, from what I understand, I don't want to speak for her, but it's driven by finding that balance between um, the actual, um, you know, in the, uh, for a better term, infill. Uh, yeah. development and trying to keep trying to keep trying to make it easier for projects uh, to be built in those districts at 20 inches that way they're they're concentrated in those areas and not projects that are spread out in other areas of the city where the tree canopy is greater you know that does not help um, the urban heat island factor though and that's that was my art that when right. I met Carolyn, that was my biggest argument Right. Like, look, you know, the benefits of a 15 inch tree versus a 20 inch tree are clearly much different. And I said, you get you get uh, many more benefits, um, obviously, from uh, from a larger tree. So we want to save a larger tree. Um, and it's wonderful that we have we have two pushes here. We have the the uh, Rob, I see you for a second. I'll get to you one second. So we have the whole we have the whole we have the whole infill ordinance that is now allowed that we're not discussing right now. But you just think about this, if you have the infill ordinance developing private properties in the same places where we have the STO at 20 inches, you're not only losing infill development canopy that is in private neighborhoods and private property, you're losing the other canopy at 20, which you can cut down everything. You can cut down from one inch to 100 inches or however big it is, it doesn't matter in an infill. What you're also losing on these development, you're losing uh, 20 inch trees and greater and only getting half the replacement of those trees. So what I'm trying to say is that in the, in the same place where the urban heat island is the greatest is where the affects of tree loss is gonna be felt the most. Right. And, and also the point, oh, I'm sorry, it's Rob's turn. So I, I just wanna say that, um, you know, I am, spoken to Carol Mission, I don't really know exactly what her thought process is, but I have read a fair amount about city planning and um, it is clearly like a, a number one tenant of their, of many progressive um, 
city planners that you want as much urban density as possible in a city. In other words, you want you want to have a very dense core. And so uh, the only way to do that is in Northampton is to allow further development in close. And so again, I'll just go to, I know people might not like the particular development, but behind the post office where they built all those townhouses, that is from a city planning point of view, a win. They may have cut down trees, but that's that's a win. And it's a win for a lot of reasons, many of them environmental. So there is another side to the environmental impacts than the removal of the tree. And um, this has to do with creating neighborhoods where you can live without cars, which eliminating one car off the road, you know, I don't have the numbers, but eliminate, you know, that's way bigger than cutting down a 20 inch tree. Um, and, and having those townhouses where a wall is shared rather than um, everyone having a separate house, like it would be out in the two acre zone, is just in terms of heat. So, so it saves heat, it, it saves um, transportation. Uh, it, and and it, it also does mean that people will live there where they maybe they cut down a tree or two instead of cutting down two acres of trees on the outside. So there, there the, I think the problem is that we look at the lens our lens is trees, which is great. I mean, we're here because of trees and like, trees are wonderful, but there are other lenses that I think are very valid and really important. And so I feel very much like I, supporting um, Carolyn Mish's mission is very, very important. Um, and that we need to think of what happens if that tree gets so, if there's a lot downtown with one tree on it, and then some, and then there's six townhouses on that lot, what's the overall change that happens? And one of those changes is also the support of businesses downtown, so that when people live near downtown, they shop downtown, they walk around downtown. If you build outside, they're likely to drive over to King Street, park in a big parking lot. It's just two different worlds. It's it's a world of a village and town and a world of a sort of a more suburban model. And they're, they're weighing it heavily on, on the city, town, uh, urban core model. And, and for us to like monofocus on the tr loss of trees, which I do think is pretty minor because there aren't that many trees involved. I, I think, we, we don't know that. Uh, Molly asked a good question. Are there trees? downtown of 20 inches how many we don't know we don't know but my my guess is we're not talking about cutting down huge numbers of forests um in the in that zone the 20 the 20 inch zone um and we are talking about changing lifestyles for large numbers of people and supporting downtown so uh, i don't know how as a commission because people have raised the, the issue of well, we're here to support trees and the canopy. How you then um, blend that with the overall go goals of the city and other environmental goals, which would be having a dense downtown, except I think that um, Sue or Jen touched on it, that, that um, by working with planning and development and Carol Nish, blending our, our thoughts, which we've done a great job of, then we come up with something that um, meets more overall goals without the monofocus. Jen was holding off. Thanks, Jen. I just, uh, I today I have to leave at six o'clock. I'm just saying that. I'm not sure that that'll affect the- Three uh, minutes. If that affects the- Six um, minutes. Six <laughs> minutes, great. Uh, you still have a quorum, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. All right. I just Molly said, was next. Molly was trying to say. Um. Thanks, Jen. What was I going to say? I forget what I was going to say. Never mind. It almost looks like we have to think about building structural soil spots downtown strategically to try to mitigate what will be probably denser and denser development. If we're realistic. Um, I think that the 
overall sustainability goals of the city have a tremendous amount of buy-in and they do conflict with these trees. I think, I think you're right, Sue, that the only way to really have the city be green, have, have a canopy downtown is lots of structural soil everywhere. I'm so glad to see hmm. that on Warfield Place, it, it's the first street that I know of where there's a large scale effort to plant trees using structural soil. It's a great thing. And I, and I, I have no idea, Rich, whether that's something we can expect to ha happen repeatedly or is that like a one-off? I don't know. Uh, I, I think you're going to see that that's going to be part of the, it's part, it was part, it's been part of the construction document and other projects and it's going to continue to go forward. Um, and uh, as you've probably noticed, we really haven't done any paving this year. So we've held off a year and I think we're, I, I internally speaking, operationally speaking, I think we're um, re-looking at how our paving process happens in regards, because there's, you know, there's a lot of moving parts. Um, so I, I'm not sure what, what is in store for next year. I'll know more this fall probably or early winter. So, but yeah, Rob, I think it's really, the technology exists. And I think we need to utilize it. And during development, these developments, we need to actually, um, you know, basically in essence, I wouldn't, I like to use the word force, but basically say to the developer, you will use this structural soil to plant, you know, as a growing medium for these 10 trees you're replacing that mm -hmm. are on this street, you know, and that was done on Cumberland Farms in Florence as part of, um, that was the planning board wanted this, wanted that. So it's been used in the past. So I think it's great, um, Molly. That idea of the structural soil just made a light bulb go off my head. I wonder if um, as a penalty, like in this ordinance that we're talking about, um, instead of them replacing the tree with, let's say a 20 inch tree with 21 inch trees, which you know my argument, that just drives me crazy because it's not equivalent, um, that they have to replace, um, that they have to buy or give enough money to the city to buy structural soil that would be sufficient for a 20 inch tree to grow in because then we could because that stuff is expensive and um that's sort of our limiting factor to be able to plant more trees downtown and if downtown is going to be more dense with buildings and stuff the only way you know to have um effectively like use smaller space but to still get trees squeezed in there is to use a structural soil so maybe that would make it possible to still have trees downtown, even if it's very dense with buildings. It's it's possible. You got to be careful though when you're using trade names and ordinances because if the trade name disappears, then we you have to go back uh -huh. to the whole ordinance. So, but I mean, I I totally, I totally see. I mean, I you know I think there's an ordinance that's crafted that talks about the city's tree list and planting guidelines, right? So. The city's tree list and planting guidelines are all in the new ordinance. And we, trees shall be planted in structural soil where appropriate. That, that can actually be put in the tree list and planting guidelines. So that has to be followed. So when an applicant comes to the planning board and they have their final plan put together prior to approval, that their planting medium has to be shown in a plan, et cetera. Um, I'm not so sure you could tie that to the actual tree replacement and the cost of it all. I, I don't know how that would work, but it's it's an interesting thought. Um, anyone else have comments? Carol's been making a number of comments. Yep. Uh, yes, the answer to training volunteers will be all is yes. Um, we have we have considered the thank you we have considered yes. the, the effect of downtown trees because actually that's how we ended up with um, the uh, um, the chart that we had or the um, the table that talked about reducing the sizes of trees from twenty inch down now they're they we originally came back our original draft at twelve inches between six and twelve inches twelve inches being in the center of town six inches being basically everywhere else center of the city I should say. Um, and Carol is correct in saying that uh, the new development is energy efficient. The houses being built in Bay State are not cited for solar and are fossil fuel energy. And the, the one thing I can say about that is that they are, um, those buildings, those homes in Bay State are all by right construction. 
So fossil fuels are still allowed by right construction, but we, the city is in the process of, the mayor has asked if we can develop a home rule petition to make all new construction uh, fossil fuel free. But those are all great points, Carol, thank you. Uh, anyone else have any comments? I, it's 6.03, I just wanna see where everyone's at and what their time frame is. I need I, to end pretty soon. Okay, so would I would I be uh, would it be correct in my thinking that we need to table this to our next meeting? Yes, and I think it would be great to get the guy from Cambridge to come as well as who the was storm, that person? The stormwater. Expert. Yeah, and the stormwater guy. Yeah, okay. one, not maybe not at the same meeting, but one after the other. So um, I will. I think Rob has already reached out to Andrew Putnam and he's available for our next meeting, but I'll confirm that with Rob. And then potentially I can um, have Doug come to the following meeting in October. Doug McDonald, if that's okay. That would be great. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll skip over, I guess everything. I just, unless I, I can add these other items to our, of course the DCR Community Challenge Grant, that's, just want to touch base on that because we have to have a letter of intent and I don't I don't think that we have a project in the in the pipeline where we're going to actually have the letter of intent in for time because it has to be done by October 1st. Mm. So it would have to be sent next week. Yes. Yep. Do we have a model of a letter that we've sent in the past and could we plug in a project does it doesn't need commission approved nope. never has in the past at least no the only thing we, we have two letters we have the ej grant and we have the inventory letter that that we can model after and send those in but the question is are we actually going to be are we actually gonna be able to do those things are we gonna are we actually gonna be able to support those things, including the tree inventory that I had talked about. I, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't have enough information. To, to As usual, it all falls on, I mean, in the end, it falls on you, Rich, right. to provide everything from the beginning to the end, all the budget numbers, everything. Yeah, that, that that's not so much a problem. So I think it's more of whether or not we actually think it's a wise use of our time to apply for one of these grants at this time. Mm. And that's, I think that, that, I mean, I'll, I'll do whatever it takes to make the grant work, don't, you know, because that's what we need to do. But I think it's a question of whether or not as a commission, we're in a position to support and, and write the grant letter to a, for a particular grant application that we want yeah. or a particular grant that we're looking for. So. Well, we didn't have any real solid firm ideas of what we were asking for, right? Right. So I, right. I, I talked about the inventory a little bit with you. I also, yeah, about, right. um, we talked about planting, but planting grants for us, um, while the last EJ grant turned into a planting grant, um, funding for tree plantings and the sundries that go with tree plantings and projects has not been an issue for us uh, locally. And it will probably not be an issue for us in the, in the near future. So um, the wood bank, you know, applying for a wood bank grant to do wood bank work to develop a wood bank is another grant application. I remember that uh, would probably apply to us, but again, that's going to require that's going to require work from myself and a few other. Yeah, yeah to, I think we have our hands full right now okay. with STO. Okay, all right, okay. And spotted land and fly and our yeah enormous planting and tree care program. Okay. All right, I have some other thoughts about the inventory that I will share with you at the next meeting. Um, and then I just, before we leave, I just wanted to quickly talk to you quickly about the Western Mass Tree Warden, Mass Tree Wardens and Foresters dinner speaking engagement. So I forwarded you an email um, that Henry um, Lappin invited us to, uh, to basically come to the meeting and speak uh, to support Henry or to speak about our own program and what things that we see. So if there's, it would be nice to have uh, a couple members of the commission there who will be willing to um, speak if, if called upon about our, about our program. I will be at the meeting representing Mass Tree Wardens, but I will 
I will speak if, if needed, but it'd be great to have some other folks there as well. Okay, the date is? Um, this, I want to say it's the 6th. October 13th? October 13th, I believe so. I believe you're correct. Let me just double check. Mm. Yes, I, it is the 13th, Thursday the 13th. I, I'm not available that night. Okay. All right. We, we have we have some time um and then if uh i can if i if if some commission members are interested in going then i can sign you all up and take care of that take care of that uh on my on my end so i just need to know i i will reach out to jen and ask her if she's interested i think henry was actually basically wanting to talk about um as we said about the like the changes to MGL 87. I think the, their Amherst position on trying to get a, a similar tree protection ordinance like uh, like our SDO. And they've had um, a lot of difficulty with that. Sue and I had the uh, potluck with them and that was a big topic that we discussed. Um, okay, Christina, thank you very much. Um, she has to sign off. So I just, if someone, if. Members would like to go. I can take care of the the uh, door fee and everything else from, and you can just show up. And... I can probably do it. I just checked my. Okay. Knowledge. All right. Okay, we got one commissioner. All right. Okay, I will <laughs> plan you, you, on the, it. The date and time again, Rich. Yeah, yeah it's the thirteenth at five o'clock, Rob. Thirteenth. at diner. And Henry wants to talk about complete streets. Yep. Which I don't know much about, but I could learn. I could certainly relay my strong feelings about how certain neighborhoods, the poor neighborhoods, to be blunt, have really bad tree belts and complete street just further exacerbates that inequality. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother topic that we could delve into that we could spend as much time talking about as we <laughs> have. Mm. Um, Okay, so those those were the two things that I just wanted to touch base with you on before we adjourned. I wanted to ahead. mention if we're on the other business. Yes. Um, as far as getting another tree commissioner, yeah, uh, this could go on to the next meeting. But I have a friend who might be interested, but she's worried that she doesn't have any relevant skills. She's a good writer, so she could do you know public like writing kind of stuff. But, um, and she knows about nature and trees in general, but not specific. So I don't know what we want to do about that. Well, um, would you be interested in coming to a meeting as a guest just to kind of see? What... That's true. That's a good idea. You... I could, I'll invite her to the next meeting. Okay. Yeah. And I'm also, I've reached out to the tree warden of East Hampton. Um, I'd like, she'll, I'd like to have her come to a November meeting as a guest. So I'm trying to line up guest speakers and, um, uh, Every one one guest speaker a month, so I think it's going to be great to hear from Andrew. It's going to be great to hear from Doug, um, and then we can just kind of intertwine the STO discussion in those two meetings. If you're okay with that, and then we can talk I about. I think it's great. I love. I learned so much about the spotted lanternfly. The well, last I, one, and yeah. I so look forward to Andrew Putnam. It's wonderful. Um, David, do you have any follow-up comments to, are you, are you okay with us tabling the STO until we hear from other folks? Yes, I, I would be in favor of that. Okay, all right. And I, I thank Carol too for her thoughtful comments tonight. Yes, yeah. Really, yeah. I've added a lot and stuck with it, so. Stuck with it, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Carol. Okay, does anyone have any other business uh, not anticipated by the chair? Uh, one thing to follow up on what Molly said about um, the, her friend who was interested possibly in being a commissioner, I noticed that uh, Councillor Jarrett and Councillor Moulton both have newsletters. Um, and I noticed that they, I know I, Councillor Jarrett actually posted in his newsletter about a, a vacancy on one of the commissions. I can't remember the name of the commission, but I'm wondering if uh, if I, I I think it would be okay I think it would be okay for us to advertise advertise if you want to call it that yeah why not 
if there's a vacancy on the Urban Forestry Commission, I just would like to get the mayor's approval because I, I thought the mayor was going to actually create a list and put some kind of media, um, uh, a media a press release of some sort out to talk about these vacancies throughout the city, but they haven't done it so far. So I will prod them and I'll get back to you by our next meeting, but I think that might be a good way too to let citizens know. Yeah. I think Rachel Mayori also has a, a list, email list. So, they probably all do. Yeah, so let's um, let's plan on, um, I'll just put that on the next, uh, I'll put that on our next agenda as a little five minute talking point. And then Molly, if you want to invite your friend, that would be great. At least, you know, she doesn't, she doesn't stay for the whole meeting if she can, if she wants. But. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, anyone else have anything else? All right. Uh, could I get a motion to adjourn? I'll move to that we adjourn. There's a motion. Can I have a second? Second. second row. Okay. David. All right. So we have a motion to adjourn uh, and second it. And um, without further ado, I am good. If everyone else is good. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, David, for and Molly.